Uh, that's our prayer, Lord, that you would just uh, lead me in the power of your Holy Spirit. Give me the words to share, the words of encouragement. Uh, let us learn, Father, what you had for the early church and how you worked. And let us learn what that means for Calvary Chapel and Gridley and for each one of us here, Father. Uh, things that we should emphasize in our lives and allow you to work through our lives. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the last couple of weeks, we've been going through chapter one of the book of Acts. And a couple of verses I do want to just remind people. In verses four and five, Jesus, right before he ascended, 10 days before this day that we're talking about, he was meeting with the disciples. And it said, being assembled there together with him, Jesus commanded his disciples to not depart from Jerusalem, to stay where you are, and to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. And verse five of chapter one said, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. In other words, in just a few days, you're going to be what's called the baptized, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he clarified what that was. In verse 8, he actually says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. So this baptism of the Holy Spirit is a power that's going to be coming upon them. They already have the Holy Spirit in them, but it's another um, experience or um, uh, aspect of the Holy Spirit coming upon the believers. And it's going to give them a power, a dynamite power, we saw that word meant, to be his witness. And that's what the Holy Spirit does in our lives of Jesus Christ. And as we continued in verse 14, it says, and they all continued in one accord and in prayer and supplication. They're all together with one mind waiting for the Lord. And now we're in chapter 2. And I'd like to read the first four verses. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, and they were all in one accord in one place, suddenly there came the sound of a wind as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. And one sat upon each of them. And then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You see... It says when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord. They were told to stay in one accord. We saw in chapter 1 they were in one accord, right? And now we see that they're still in the same place waiting for this promise of the Father to come upon them. The day of Pentecost is one of three major Jewish holidays. The first major Jewish holiday is that of Passover. And that's normally the middle of March to April. It's in the spring. And that's the day that we, that the Jewish people do this remembrance of how God delivered them, right, the Hebrew people, out of Egypt. That's what the Passover is. The second holiday, and that's what we're going to be talking about next, was known as the Feast of Pentecost. And that's what we're going to be referring to today. Pentecost means 50 days. Penta is 50, and that's Pente Pentecost. And that actually occurs at the end of May or early June. It's in the early summertime. And it's at that time that they have the harvest festivals. And they actually, it's a time of thanksgiving to the Lord for his providing the harvest of the grain crops. And that's 50 days following Passover. And then there's a third holiday, which is called the Feast of Tabernacles. We talked about this in the book of John, or the Feast of Booths. And that actually is the end of September or early October in the fall area. And that's a celebration that the Jews do that after they were, they were delivered, how God actually took care of them in the difficult conditions as they were on their way for 40 years to the promised land. And it was a requirement that if you lived within a reasonable distance of about 20 miles of Jerusalem, that you as a male adult would have to attend every one of these three feasts. That was a requirement. And actually come and present yourself to God. <clears throat> 
However, if you live outside of that, it would encourage, strongly encourage that you at least attend one of them. And so if you were a Jewish person or if you've been proselytized to the Jewish faith, in other words, you weren't a Jewish by faith to begin with, but now you now have Judaism as your main um, belief, then you were encouraged to come to at least one of these major feasts. And so we read that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, so the Pentecost is here, 50 days after what? Passover. And the Passover, we know, is the remembering God's deliverance of the Hebrew slaves out of Egypt. We know that God told the Pharaoh to let him go, and he didn't let him go. So God told them, the Israelite people, to take a, a lamb, an unblemished lamb, right? To sacrifice that lamb, and then to apply the blood of the lamb, where? On the doorposts and on the mantle of the door, right? And all those that were under the blood of the lamb, when the angel passed over, they were saved. If they weren't, then the firstborn of all the livestock and the firstborn of all the people, what? Died. And so we got to realize that 50 days ago, that the lamb of God, that takes away the sins of the world, Jesus Christ was just what? Sacrificed for our sins. And you see the application there pretty strongly. You see... Just as the lamb was put over the lentils and over the, 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 the doorposts and the, and the mantle and the angel of death passed over to all those who applied the blood, every person who's applied the blood of Jesus Christ on their lives, who's received it and is under the blood of Jesus Christ, is also saved. And instead of being delivered from Egypt, we are now delivered from the bondage of what? Sin in our lives from the world. That's exactly right. So this is the day Pentecost that they're talking about. Probably the best time for traveling to Israel, if you were traveling back in those days, was probably the one in the late spring, early summer, and that would have been Pentecost. It would have been best for traveling by boats or by, 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 by foot, whatever it is. So the Feast of Pentecost would have been packed with people from all over the known world. Everywhere they would be coming, probably to this from ever. So you would have people from all over speaking all these different languages. And all the different dialects at that time. The Feast of Pentecost was also marked, if I can pop up the slide there, of taking a portion of the field. They'd harvest the field, and they'd take the stalks, and they'd wrap them up in bundles. And the bundles were called sheaves. That's not a word we use too often. You know, hey, Luke, will you go get the sheaves and bring them inside so we can beat the grain out of them? We don't talk that way anymore, right? But you remember the song, Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. I'm talking to the older people now. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, right? So that's what they were talking about. This was the time they'd do this. They'd tie them together, and they would actually present them before the Lord as a wave offering to the Lord. The priest would do that, a wave offering, if you've heard that. That's because they'd have these sheaves tied together, and they would, they would actually be saying, God, you, you get the first fruits of everything we've harvested, God. Because we know as we give you the first fruits, you're going to provide a great bounty for another harvest that will come as we continue. But the first part of the harvest will belong to you. And it's very appropriate because we're going to see that 3,000 people were going to be saved as the first fruits of people coming to the Lord. A first harvest for what? A future harvest that God's going to bring in. Just give you that little preview before we come. But verse 2 now starts, and it says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. That's what the word suddenly means. It means you weren't expecting it. Of a, of, a, of a tornado, the sound of crashing winds coming in, and this actually came in and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. The, riding, the rushing mighty means like a, a violent, a forcible wind, loud enough to just come blasting out of this house, this room that they were sitting in. And it says that in verse 3, something else appeared. So the first phenomenon was this huge wind that would come upon the house. Then it actually says, 
that there appeared on them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. The word divided actually means to be cut in pieces or to be distributed. And the word tongues is the word glossier. And the word glossier actually means a language or a dialect used by a particular people distinct from others of that nation. Interesting. That's what the word means. Glossa. And it says, as a fire. And when I looked up the word Greek word for fire, it's pyro. It means fire. So it was like this fire was on each person's head. And at the same time, now you got to realize, there's 120 of them, right? There's 120 people there. We have, we have Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. We have Jesus' brothers were there. We have the 12 disciples were there because Judas was replaced by Matthias, the previous chapter. We have the other disciples that were following. So 120 of them, all this was happening on each one of them. And verse 4 says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And that word tongues is again glossa. So as the Spirit came upon them, and they were now filled with the Spirit, a third phenomenon happened. Number one, this wind fills a place. Number two, they have these little fires on top of their heads. And then number three, they start speaking in a language that is not known to them. They start speaking in a glossa, in a foreign language, in a foreign dialect, actually, which would be totally difference. So we see here that God gave what's called the gift of tongues to these early believers at this time. And I'm going to clarify some things throughout this study as we continue on through about this gift, this gift that some people have no understanding about it called the gift of tongues. And number one, the gift of tongues is the ability to speak a tongue, a glossa, another language. And it was a gift given to the disciples Notice, as the Spirit gave them utterance. It isn't something you can make yourself do. It's got to be something the Holy Spirit does from you. And it's actually a different language, as we will see. So these three, three different phenomenons that occurred, everybody's watching. And it says in verse 5, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, and check this out, from every nation under heaven. So this place was filled from people through out the known world, speaking different languages, right? They probably all spoke the common language, which was Greek. But they also have their native language from their own homeland. And it says that they're here in this location at this time. And it says in verse 6 that when this sound occurred, the multitude now came together and were confused. Because they now hear all these people speaking in their own language. They hear a sound. Now, we're not too sure it just says, and when this sound occurred, we're not too sure if this was the sound of the mighty rushing wind going through this, this room, or if it was the sound of them speaking with all these different languages. We're not too sure. It could be both of those areas. But whatever it was, it was loud enough, it was powerful enough that it caused all these people, there's probably one to two million people at this time in Jerusalem celebrating the Feast of Pentecost, and they are start coming in and rushing in because they hear this actually happening at this time. And verse 7 and 8 says, and they were all amazed and marveled. And they said to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans from Galilee? But how is it, we're confused, how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? It's interesting because they're talking to each other. Angela and I have traveled um, and had a blessing of traveling to different countries. And when we go on a cruise or we go different places, we'll sit with people. They might be from Spain. They might be from Portugal. They might be from, from different places throughout the world. And what we found is the common language that everyone speaks when you're all together is English. Everybody, they all speak English. I don't speak it. If I'm from with somebody from Germany, I got Angela because she's fluent in German. You know what I mean? So that helps us when we're going through Austria or Germany. 
But English is the known language, the common language that is spoken of all around. The common language there was Greek, so they're all rushing together and they're, they're, they're speaking this, in this common language to each other saying, look, these guys aren't from where we live, but we hear them speaking in our native tongue. They're from Galilee. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, you've got to realize the people from Galilee were fishermen and farmers. They're the un, uncultured people. They're the common people. They aren't the people that had a college education and would learn to speak different languages other from them from where they're from and they were just really probably incredibly in, impressed for them to, to speak this language and it says so here's the, the next point I want to make sure you understand the gift of tongues is the gift of the Holy Spirit that enables one to speak in a foreign language in which you have had no previous previous training in you didn't know that language, and all of a sudden, out of them is coming this language. These people are speaking this language. The Holy Spirit fills them, and they start speaking this foreign language. And these people from the other countries are hearing them speaking, and they're going, wait a second, those are Galileans. But I'm hearing some of them speak what? In my language. That's what they said. Well, what were the different languages that they could have been speaking of? It actually talks about 15 different locations and languages. So look at verse 9. It says, Parthenians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia and Egypt, and parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretan and Arabs. And listen to this. We hear them speaking in our own language, in our own tongue, the wonderful works of God. They weren't talking to, again, in, to the men. They were speaking directly to God, the wonderful works of God. So here's the third thing I want you to realize. The gift of tongues is to speak in a foreign language, but you're speaking and declaring the wonderful works of God. It'd be like hearing a psalm be spoken, praising God and worshiping God. And it says in verse 12 and 13 that those that were visiting Jerusalem, that they actually said they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, how could this be? Whatever could this mean? And others said, I know what it is. It's because they've been drinking some booze. They're full of new wine. I mean, yeah. It would be phenomenal. You're there, you're, whoosh, you hear this noise, you come running up, you see these 120 people, maybe on the balconies or coming out of the house now, and they got these fires on their head and they're speaking language and they're going, wait a second, you know, I'm, I'm from, from Phrygia and I'm here and speaking the language that I'm from. How can they be? That doesn't make any sense. And the other person, well, I'm from this part of Arabia and I'm here and speak my known tongue. How can that be? And they were all kind of amazed and perplexed and they had no idea Whatever, and I, I like that. Whatever could this mean? They're seeing this, these three phenomenons, and they ask an on a question that you should ask. If you see something that looks weird, and this, I'm sure, looked and sounded weird, and it is, right? It's strange to see this happening. You say, what in the gaboodles is happening here? I don't get it. And I like the people who didn't, didn't ask that question. Instead, they said what? They're full of new wine. Because we all know that if you have a few shots of wild turkey, you'll be speaking what? Turkish. <laughs> and if you have a pint, you're probably going to be fluent. I mean, so their logic is, if I'm under the influence of alcohol, then I'll be able to speak I mean, sign me up. You know, if that's what you got to do, hook on phonics or whatever it is. You know, if I just got to learn a foreign language, I'll just start drinking. It doesn't work that way, guys. It doesn't work. I didn't mean sign me up like I'm going to get drunk. Don't worry, I'm not going to do that. I was trying to be funny, and then it came out of my mouth, and I thought, no filter. There's no filter there. It just kind of came out. It doesn't make any sense, but they were looking at this, and they're just trying to figure out what it could be. So I just want to review a few things in talking about the gift of tongues, because I want to talk a little bit about that this morning, because it is a very confusing 
gift of the Holy Spirit. And we see right here. And so I'm going to review number one. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the gift that was given to the disciples as the Spirit gave them utterance. It wasn't something they did themselves. Number two, it enabled them to speak in a foreign language that they had no previous knowledge of. These guys were Galileans. Number three, it's a foreign language that if you knew that language, you'd be able to what? Understand. It wasn't just gibberish. It was an actual language. And number four, that that language was declaring the wonderful works of God. There's no... There's no controversy here. The Holy Spirit actually gave the church here the gift of tongues. But there is a question sometimes that people ask, that what is the purpose of the gift of tongues today in today's church? Because that was back then. What about today? So I'm going to take a second and explain that. Because <clears throat> there was another church that was having what I'm going to call the abuse of this gift of gifts of tongues, and that was a church in Corinth. In fact, Paul actually had to write an entire chapter, chapter 14 in 1 Corinthians, to correct some of the things that were happening with this gift that they were messing up and that they were not doing correctly. And so it's good in the aspect that we have some really clear direction. See, in Corinth, everyone spoke the same language like we do here in English. They spoke the language, they're Greek. And 1 Corinthians 14, 1 and 2 says... Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Let me stop here a second. <clears throat> the gift of prophecy is speaking forth God's word in a language that you all understand. Right now I'm speaking to you in what? English. As I speak forth God's word, that's what I'm doing, God is giving me the gift of prophecy. You go, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. He's just speaking forth God's word. And I pray that he gives me that gift along with, with discernment and, and different aspects so that I can rightly divide God's word and speak forth God's word. And it says that here in verse 1, that we should pursue love, right? That we should desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Because as I'm sharing to you and you understand what I'm saying, because I'm not speaking in a foreign language, then you guys can be edified, right? You can learn, you will grow, and you go, oh, that makes sense. Oh, I understand now. He then says in verse 2 of that same chapter, for he who speaks in tongues does not speak to men, but to God. And no one understands him. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. So that's the point I want you to understand here. As it said in 14.2, he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. So if you hear a gift of tongue, you've got to realize it's going to be speaking to who? God, not to a person. I'm going to talk about the gift of interpretation in the second of tongues, which is another gift. The reason I'm bringing this out slowly is in some churches, and I've witnessed this in some churches, that there will be in their open service, which we're not going to allow in our open service, and I'll tell you why scripturally in a second, that someone will come up and give a tongue, and they'll speak a language, and they'll sit down, amen, and then someone will come up and will give something in English, which is supposed to be the interpretation of that tongue. But they'll say something like this, my dear people, God wants you to do the following things. Or God is telling you something. Well, that's not speaking to God. That's speaking to who? People. If you're speaking to people, God's word, that's got to be the gift of prophecy. The gift of tongues is always going to be speaking. A gift of tongue would be, praise you, Lord, we thank you, God. You know, glory and honor and salvation belongs to you. It'd be some psalm, some prayer to who? God. I want to make sure you get that clear, really clear. Verse 14 of chapter 14 continues and says, For if I spray in a if I spray, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. In other words, I would be given a tongue which is a praise unto God, and my, my spirit would just be worshiping at that time. But I have no idea what I'm what? Saying. I don't know what I'm saying at all. And you might say, Well, why would that ever happen? I'll get to that in a second. The gift of tongues is not speaking to men, but to God. Thus, if a person is speaking in tongues, he is speaking the wonderful works of God 
to God. He's praising God. He's praying to God. He's worshiping God, but he's never speaking to man. When a person speaks in tongues, he does not know what he's saying. And unless you understand that foreign language that he's speaking in, you also will not understand what he's saying. Is that clear? And looking at the scriptures, because I want God's word to explain this to you. He continues in verse 18, and I'm going to encourage you, go home and look at this yourself if you have questions. And he says in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians, I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than all of you. This is, this is what Paul is saying. Yet, in the church, in a setting like we have, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others than what? 10,000 words in a tongue. In other words, in a church setting like this, where you have people that might understand what's happening or not understand what's happening, this is not the place. I'd rather speak something that you would understand what's being said, right? And all these things that you cannot understand. Thus, in a church setting like we are right now, the gift of prophecy speaking in God's word in one own language should occur, but not the gift of tongues. <clears throat> Verse 23 says, Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak in tongues, and there comes in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are all out of your mind? The answer is yes. But if all prophesy, that's what? Speaking forth God's word so that you understand. And an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he's going to hear and understand what's being said. He's going to be convinced by all and convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his hearts will be revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. So in a church setting where you have people who don't understand what we're talking about or people who aren't saved, if someone comes in the congregation and starts speaking out in, in tongues, then people are going to say, that sounds crazy. And therefore, in a setting like we have this morning, it's not allowed. If someone was to do that during a worship, you'd probably see Brad quietly get up and walk to the front. And I'd say, can I please have all of you open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 14? And I would explain to you, not to be rude, but I don't want you walking away here confused because somebody had just done that. Does that make sense? And I would do a teaching because that's my job to make sure that you guys understand what's happening and what's not. It's not to reprove the person or correct the person. It's to make sure you understand because this is not the setting. So then Brad... What is the correct setting? Are you thinking that? Then what is the correct setting for the gift of tongues? I'm going to say there are two correct settings that I see. I'm open if you have something else that I see for the correct setting for the gift of tongues. Number one, I believe if you have a gathering of believers and all the believers are informed, they understand like I'm teaching you right now about the gift of tongues. And the purpose of that meeting was to worship God and to praise God and to have a prayer meeting and to wait on the Lord, a different setting. Some people call it an afterglow or whatever you might want to have it. And you wanted a time of praying, that would be the correct setting. However, in that correct setting, I would have to know if somebody has what's called the gift of the interpretation of tongues. In other words, for a tongue to be said, you have to have a proper interpretation or there's not going to be any edification. If you just hear a tongue and you don't know what's being praised or what's being shared, I'm not going to be able to worship and praise God with you. And so it says in verse 14, chapter 14, verse 9, so likewise, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking in the air. And so he says in verse 5, I wish you all spoken tongues, but even more than uh, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues. Watch this, unless indeed he interprets it that the church may receive edification. Verse 16 continues and says, otherwise if you bless or praise, 
when you bless and praise, that's God, right? If you bless and praise with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place, the place of the informed be able to say amen to your giving of thanks since he doesn't know what you say? If indeed you give thanks well, but the other is not edified. So if I'm standing here, and if I'm sitting here and I give some tongue, and you don't know what I'm saying, you're not going to be edified. So he continues to say here in verse 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or three or the most in turn. In other words, you're going to take turns and let one interpret. In other words, if somebody was to speak in tongues in that setting, let one interpret. And if one interprets, now I can say, I know what he's saying. I understand what he's saying. And therefore, everyone would be edified. And it says, but if there is no interpreter, then let that person keep silent in the church and let him speak himself and to God. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as of all the churches and the saints. Everything has to be done in order. God wants no confusion in any type of a worship service. So that would be the one setting. It would be a special setting where you have believers, and that's the purpose of the intent, to wait on the Lord, to hear the Lord speak, to worship God, for praying, for whatever it might be. That would be the one setting. The other setting is kind of speaking through right here in this verse. If you can pop that back up there in verse 28. It says, if there's no interpretation, then let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to what? Who? Himself and to God. The second setting that I would see is in one's own personal devotional life, where I am now speaking and praying to the Lord myself. It says in verse Corinthians 4 and in verse 14, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So if you're to pray in a tongue, pray in a tongue, and this, that, that God would give you, it's a gift of the spirit, there is an edification. There's sometimes, I don't know what to pray for in a situation. I have no idea what God's will is. I have no idea what, the whole, what God wants to do in this certain setting. But I know he does, and I want what he wants. And so to pray in the Spirit, you're asking the Lord to work and to pray and to lift up this need to him. And thus, I'm edified. It works as a personal prayer language for a person given to him by God. It says in verse 15 of same Corinthians, so what then? What's the conclusion? I will pray with the Spirit, this is himself personally in tongues, but I also will pray with understanding in a known language. I will sing personally in a tongue, but I also will sing in understanding in a known language. I think tongue can probably the greatest use of it is one's own private personal devotional life. Paul did talk about in Romans uh, something also in chapter 8, 26. It says, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. There are situations, again, I'm not too sure what the Lord's will is. I don't know. It's a weakness that I have. I don't know everything that God wants me to know, what his will is for a situation, but the Spirit does. And I pray the Spirit will help me intercede. And it says, but the Spirit himself will make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, I might just groan to the Lord and just ask God, I give it to you, Lord. This might be another situation where we just don't know what we're saying, but we're asking the Lord just interceding. Those are the two settings that I would see it being done. But I want you to understand that the gift of tongues, like all spiritual gifts, as we will see in 1 Corinthians 12 here, that it's a gift that's not given to every believer. There are some churches that think unless you speak in the gift of tongues, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. That is unscriptural. That is wrong. Make that clear. There are churches that will make you feel that if you don't receive the gift of tongues, then you are somewhat second-class citizens, that the Holy Spirit cannot fill your lives. And the reason why that is unscriptural is because of these verses. 1 Corinthians 12, 4. There are a diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. Verse 10 says, and he lists them. Starts with, he's just a partial list. To another, the workings of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, they get the discerning of spirits. To another person, they get a different kinds of tongues. 
to another they might get the interpretation of God. tongues. Verse 11 is huge. But the one and the same Spirit works in all things, distributing these gifts to each one individually as what? He wills. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the gifts. And many times if he calls you into a ministry, he will give you the gifts that you need for that ministry. That would be a very unloving God not to give you the gifts that he's called you to do. And so he will equip you to do the gifts with what he has. So just want to do a little uh, teaching on that because we are here in this and we can now continue here. Paul initially addressed the group of the crowd who dismissed this whole situation as being there full of new wine. But now Paul... Excuse me, but I meant Peter. Peter initially addressed this group back in Acts 2.14. Peter now standing up with the 11. Again, there's 12 of them because Matthias is now with them. Raised his voice and said to these people, all these people that are now coming, they're going, what's happening here? What is occurring? And he says, men of Judea and all who drown in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these guys aren't drunk, as you supposed. It's only the third hour of the day. We don't get drunk to the, no, not, to the middle of the day. Then it would have been, no. What he's saying here is, he's addressing those critics that said, There's, this is occurring because they're what? Drinking. He says, no. Uh, on the Pentecost days, on these, on, these, on these festival days, they actually wouldn't eat or drink till 9, 10 o'clock. They would wait till after that. There's no way that has any possibility for this to happen. And he, you got to realize, Peter now is speaking in the Greek language. He's now speaking forth. We're going to see God's word in a known language. This is a remarkable change for Peter. He's no longer this meek little guy denying the Lord to this little girl across from a fire. He's now in front of thousands and tens of thousands. It could be packed millions of people hearing him. And he, he's now filled with the Spirit of God that just came upon him. And I want you to notice that when he starts speaking forth, no one else is now speaking in what? Tongues. That stopped. It ceased. You're not going to have conflict. The Holy Spirit, they're going to stop because the Holy Spirit's now going to speak through who? Peter, when you see things happen in churches and this is happening and this is happening, and, and I, I mean, I've known, I've known people that I walked up and I said, you know, the, the, I really appreciate if you wouldn't do that because that's caused a lot of confusion. And they said, well, the Spirit came upon me. I said, no, 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 no. The Spirit was working with the worship team. You interrupted it. The Holy Spirit's not going to interrupt himself, so you're out of order. The Holy Spirit's not going to interrupt himself. You know, if I was to say, you know, I think... Uh, and we, uh, this is how Jamie and I, or, or Paul, or, you know, I, I'd like you to do a couple more songs, or I'd like you to do, I feel the Lord's leading us in that way. They say, sounds great. We'll let the Lord lead. But we, we, we yield to one another as the Lord does that. The Holy Spirit's not going to do And now we see Peter, everyone stops, and Peter now speaks to Greek and everyone. He addresses this first issue of these mockers, that these guys are drunk. He goes, no, that can't happen. It will not happen. And so now he's going to address these people that says, then what does this mean? We saw these three phenomena, and if it's not because they're drinking, then what is this? And Peter says these great words in verse 16. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. This that you are observing is what? What was spoken of in Scripture. Understand that Peter is going to give them a scriptural evidence for the spiritual phenomenon that they're going to be, that they just witnessed. You got that? There is a scriptural basis. There is a scriptural reason in Joel that he's going to say that this occurred. So he says, let's have a Bible study. And he starts taking them through something. This is vitally important. You are on dangerous ground when you are seeking some spiritual phenomenon for which there is no scriptural basis. You got to realize, they're asking, they're seeing three things that would have freaked me out and every one of us here. And they're saying, what's the meaning of this? 
And if you can't, if you see things happening and you can't give a scriptural th- a reason for it, then leave it. Then leave it. I'm not interested in any kind of phenomenon that there cannot be some scriptural basis. I think it's irresponsible for teachers and for pastors and for evangelists to promote spiritual phenomenons when there's no scriptural foundation. Back in the 1990s, 1994, what came through was something called the Toronto Blessing. And people started going up, pastors started going up for something to happen for their church. And they went up to there and they witnessed spiritual phenomena, uncontrollable laughter, emotional and physical euphoria, participants roaring like lions and making other animal noises, the electric waves of the spirit, of which there's no scriptural basis. And they started, I mean, solid Baptist teachers, I mean, solid, started going up because they wanted something to grow their church. They wanted something to bring fresh into their church instead of just teaching what? God's word, right on through. They're looking for all these spiritual things. And I remember talking to someone in my garage. We were sitting down, and he started going after all this stuff. And I just said, I, I'm, I'm concerned for you. And he was very sincere, very sincere. And he sincerely said to me, Brad, I want all that the Holy Spirit has for me. And I said, brother, I want all that the Holy Spirit wants for me. But I'm not going to go after something that doesn't align with what? God's word. The moment you start going after things that don't align with God's word, then how do you know it's of God? You have no idea. Not only that, but now I can develop, and it's happening, a spiritual hierarchy. Because I am able to read these auras or read these certain things. I'm a little more spiritual than you are. Although it's unscriptural, because I now create my own heresy. And it's alive, and it's a well, and it's infiltration the Christian churches all the time. There has to be a scriptural basis for everything. What can this be? And Peter, excuse me, yeah, Peter says, and he goes right to God's word, but this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. He gives them a solid scriptural basis for explaining what they're witnessing. And it says, verse 17, this is quoting from Joel now. It shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And and on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. He's talking about that, uh, that, that Joel said the scriptural basis was from Joel that there's going to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the when? Last days. And guys, we're in the last days. Peter says that he was in the last days. He's saying what you are witnessing here is nothing other than what was prophesied by Joel. The very things that you're seeing, the very things that you're hearing, this is an outpouring of God's Spirit upon the servants here at Pentecost when they're all done. And you know what? It continues in verse 19. It says, And I will show wonders in heavens above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke, talking about later that we haven't yet seen. And the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the coming and the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall what? Shall be saved. Wow. He's going to continue through this chapter, and you're going to see he's going to bring in Jesus Christ. We're going to have to stop here. Peter, this is Peter's first sermon. Not the same guy. He's now filled with the Holy Spirit. He now has the courage to do the things that he had no courage to do before. And he's focusing on God's word as he's speaking forth. These signs and these wonders and these speaking in tongues were, were all in preparation for this gospel message he's going to give them. And I want to ask you, have you called on the name of the Lord for your salvation? Because that's what it's all about. Those who come to the Lord shall be saved. 
Many people are looking for love in all the wrong places. We got this empty spot in our hearts, and it's got to be filled with the Lord. We need God every single day. If you don't know the Lord, I'm going to ask you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can have the assurance of salvation. Say, Lord, come in my life. And the Lord will do that for each one of us. And we'll do that in one second. But I want you guys also to know, guys, that we, too, can have this upon experience. I prayed this morning, Lord, fill my life with your Holy Spirit. hope you guys prayed that. Fill my life. Come upon me. Fill me up more. Do that, Lord. I want to be led by you every single day. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to live the life that God wants us to live. Guys, religion tells men how to give a good life, tells you what you got to do, but it gives them no what? Power to do it. But a relationship with Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit empowers one to live the godly life that God desires for us to live. And that's what he's telling these people. And that's what happens to Peter. It's now falling upon him and he's speaking forth. Guys, that's what God wants to do in our lives. He's speaking forth God's word. He's being a witness to them. You shall receive dynamite power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be a witnesses of what? Of me. And as we're going to see as we finish this chapter, that's exactly what's being done. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this powerful chapter, Lord. We thank you for your love and your grace. God, I thank you that you care about each person here, Father, what we're going through. I thank you, Lord, that you care about the busyness of our schedules, our hurts and our pains. If there's anyone here who's never asked Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior, or maybe you've walked away and you want to just recommit your life, look up, raise your hand. Is there anyone here this morning? You're looking up. Amen. If there's anyone here who's having a difficult time or you just want a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit or you want some time for prayer or you want us as a body to come to pray for you, maybe you're having some financial needs or some health issues or some difficulty or you want just a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit, look up this morning and we'll pray for you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you, way in the back. Thank you with your hands up. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen, sister. Thank you there, even back. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you up here in the front. Thank you there in the very back. Thank you, sister, there. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Let's pray, guys. Father, that's what it is, Lord. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me, Lord. Lord, do that work. Do that work in my life, God. Help me with the areas I struggle and free me from the bondage of sin. Lord, we just ask this, Father, that you would just do that work through the power of your Holy Spirit. Pray for those that are sick, that aren't feeling well. Touch them and heal them, Lord Jesus. Be strong on our behalf, God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day. We got that picnic in the park. We'll see you at Vieira Park.